religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. He says morality and virtue are the foundation of our republic and necessary for a society to be free. And he listed some examples of, of moral virtues. Love, justice, courage, temperance, reverence, prudence, and honesty. These virtues are the moral fiber and moving force to act in accordance with wisdom. Folks, these are our founding fathers. That they said, you've got to have morality. You've got to have a basis. You've got to have a foundation. If you leave the foundation, whatever we have done, constitution, declaration, it's going to be nothing. It's going to be nothing. So, we have, every year, you have a State of the Union address, right? Federal government. And you have a State of the Union address, well, a State of the State address for each state. Usually the government will give a State of the State address, let you know what's going on. Well, let's look at the State of the Union that we have now. Well, we got some problems in Western civilization, don't we? Basically, we have socialism. People want socialism. Well, not everybody, but there are people who are grasping that idea more. Oh, we kind of like that. We kind of like that. But the thing is, we need to not believe those lies. We need to follow Jesus Christ. Not just admire Jesus, but we need to follow him. Because these lies are going to be coming. They're going to make it look good. But in the end, when, when, just look at history. It never worked. It never worked. But they're trying to get people to believe it works, and it doesn't. We have globalism. You know, they're trying, they're trying to, and things are in place. They're trying to form a one world government, one world everything, globalism. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He saw a statue in his dream. The statue had a head of gold, basically chest area of silver, bronze, and then it went down to iron, and then iron mixed with clay. And basically, he's looking at, and it was a, basically a history lesson. This is what's going to happen. God was giving Nebuchadnezzar a picture of what was happening, going to happen in the world. But the thing is, when globalism, we need to continue to worship Jesus Christ, not any, anything or anybody else. And we have a global mission to let people know about Jesus Christ. And we are, what, well, whose kingdom are we waiting on, really? Who's, whose are we waiting on? Are we waiting on God's? Remember in the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come and thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're waiting for. And then you have the pandemic. Remember that? Y'all probably know what that word meant until like 2020. And then it was all over the news. Pandemic. Basically what was happening, people were sacrificing freedom for safety and security. And, and it, it's it, fear. It just promoted fear. And we need to remember, we don't need to be fearful. We need to stay calm and to keep going and to do what's right. Economic chaos. Are we in economic chaos today? Yeah, we don't know. Man, the economy, big news. Uh, I saw a, a guy who somehow he found a shopping list that he had gotten, bought things from Walmart. And he had the same exact list. Well, he said, bought, purchase again. He clicked on it. You know, he had saved it. He'd done it online. And what he had bought, I think it was a year, a year ago, a year and a half ago, was $125 or $30. Same exact items from Walmart, $438. Same items. So we're in economic chaos. But the thing is, we need to count the cost to follow Jesus Christ. We need to be confident He's taking care of it. And we need to be content in what we have. Now, I go to the same gas pumps y'all do. Right? You know? You know? <laughs> I have a, a, a gas card that I use at the Amico station. And every time I put it in there, it, I get like 10 cents off a gallon when, when we use that. And it says, we're lowering your gas prices. I keep saying, not enough. <laughs> not enough. I say, you aren't lowering them enough. But okay, I'll take it. But our culture, what, what's our culture like today in the United States? It, 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 it's, it's come a long way from what probably you remember culture. We keep saying that. The culture in America in 1996 was not the same culture we came back to in 2015 when we came back from overseas. Now we had visited during that time, but it was not the same culture. And basically you have 
more so, education is more becoming indoctrination, not so much education. And what happened? Think about this. In the 1800s in Germany, they started teaching things in the universities, and it filtered down into the what we would call the high schools and the elementary schools and into the lower grades. And basically what they were doing, it was teaching but also indoctrinating to the point it, it, it culminated in the 1930s when basically the great master race idea came about of the Germans, and they decided we need to extinguish the Jewish race. And all that came started in the 1800s in Germany. And it just filtered through until it got to a point. That's what happened. Uh, what about the case of human life in our country? Human life. You know, basically, the farther you go away from God, the less human life is sacred. The farther you get away from God, the less sacred human life is. And so we have people now that don't think anything about human life. They, they, as a matter of fact, they don't consider life human until a certain point, and then they still say, well, that's okay, in the name of science, we can do this. We can take care of this. But human life has become very low. Marriage. Marriage is a building block of society. Many people look at it as an arranged convenience now, and not a covenant, a promise of staying together. So marriage is under attack here in America. The family is under attack. People want to disintegrate the family unit. They don't want the families to be together. They don't want that. Basically, they, you can have kids, but you give us our kids. We'll take your kids. And you've heard the, the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. I think it takes a mom and a dad to raise a child. Now, yeah, you have the village and you have the influence of all of this, but it's that building block of society. God established that building block. And so but the, the family is under attack. We see a lot with gender and sexuality. A lot of things going on there, a lot of confusion, a lot of deception in that painting where they're not being told the whole truth. Religious liberty, that's being threatened now. At one time, you practice religious liberty. You can worship the way you want to, the place you want to, but unfortunately now, religious liberty has become a code word. And people say, well, you want religious liberty, but well, really, you're talking about discrimination and intolerance and racism and your homophobia, your Islamophobia, white supremacy under the guise of religious liberty. People have hijacked that word and they're putting all kinds of things to it. And then you have a cancel culture. Have y'all heard that term, cancel culture? Where basically people want to rewrite history. They, they don't want to think about what really happened. They want to rewrite it from a certain viewpoint. And the thing is, Christians are being made out to be the bad guys. We're the bad guys now. We used to be the good guys, but now we're the bad guys. And basically, people don't want to hear it. Now, let's talk about the church. That's just society. What about the church? D.A. Carson, who's a distinguished emeritus professor of the New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, he said this, People do not drift toward holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness or prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift toward compromise and call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience and call it freedom. We drift toward superstition, call it faith. We cherish <clears throat> excuse me, the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves that we have been liberated. Remember I told you in a little clip at the ark experience that we went to when they were interviewing Noah and Noah was talking about judgment and sin and the guy got mad and he stood up and he said, what you call sin, I call freedom. And you're trying to take my freedom away because I just want to do whatever I want. You know, you're talking about sin and judgment, but this guy said no. So, what do we got going on in the church? What do we got going on? Well, you got a storm going on. I never heard this term before. But we have a moralistic therapeutic deism. Y'all ever heard that term before? I haven't either. Well, I read it. Moralistic therapeutic deism. Basically, they're talking about where basically faith and beliefs, and they took surveys from people. Faith and beliefs are a you ready for this? Whatever. What do you believe? 
What do you follow? Well, whatever. Really, whatever was the answer that they got. So here's, here's a little snapshot of this moralistic therapeutic deism. God exists, and this God was written in little g, not big g. God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over the earth. Sounds pretty good so far, right? God wants people to be good, to be nice, to be fair to each other. That's not bad. But there's the moral part of it. The goal of life, to be happy and feel good about yourself. That's it. To, <clears throat> to be happy and feel good about yourself. God does not need to be involved in one's life except when needed to resolve a problem. They say, God, you stay over there. I'm going to live my life the way I want. When i got a problem, okay, come on. you got to fix it. you got to fix it. And then finally, the premise is good people go to heaven when they die. Good people go to heaven when they die. Well, my question is, who determines what's good? If everybody has their own way, who determines what's good? And so this is what a lot of people believe in. They're moral. They have... They're therapeutic. They, they want to feel good. And deism, they throw God in there, so whatever that version of God is. So, But in the church, we see a falling away. Jesus talked, the Bible talks about it, falling away. People don't want to come to church anymore. There are people called N-O-N-E-S, nuns. Not the Catholic nuns, that's N-U-N-S. The nuns, N-O-N-E-S. You ask them about religion or their faith or denomination. I'm a nun. I don't care for any of them. I'm nothing. I don't have anything to do with that anymore. I'm a nun. And so the thing is, they're falling away. People are falling away. They don't care about God. They don't care about the Bible. They, you know, I don't read the Bible. Eh, yeah, I know about the Bible. But they're falling away. Then there's a spiritual family. Hearing and reading and living God's Word doesn't have a place in many people's lives anymore. Amos had to deal with that in, in the nation of Israel. He said, look, the days are coming. This is in Amos chapter 8. The days are coming. This is a declaration of the word from the Lord. When I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea, roam from north to east, seeking the word of the Lord, but they won't find it. Basically what's happening, there was an abundance at one time of God's word. The prophets of Israel. They were giving God's word, but the people were disregarding it. They didn't care. Ah, uh, you know, another problem. You're, to, yeah, you know, I, we don't want to hear that. But then, now that they need it, they can't find it. There's no word. They can't find it. And when people, how many of you talk to people? What is it? Foxhole religion? When, when they get into trouble, they come back to God or come to God. You ever heard of that before? You know, people, you, know, you, don't, you don't see them. They, you don't get to talk to them very often. Or they're just out and out and out. And then when a problem comes, maybe it's a funeral, maybe it's a sickness or something, then, then, God help me. God help me. And, and help me. And so there's been a spiritual famine. They, people aren't reading the Bible. The thing is, we have to read the Bible. We have to study the Bible. I'm not saying you have to go to seminary. But you need to read it and study it. I've actually talked to several people, and, and I asked them about, you know, do you read your Bible for devotions? Yeah, this is how I do it. I, one guy told me this. I drop my Bible on the table, and it opens up, and I pick out a verse and read it, and that's his devotional life. I go, really? I said, that's interesting. I said, do you have the same place one? <laughs> I remember in college of Charleston when I went there as a freshman, we had to take a course in library. I had to learn how to use the library. So we had an assignment booklet. I had to fill in all these assignments. And so we went to the reference section. And I learned that, of course, all the freshmen had to take it. So I went. And I took you know, the, the question in the reference book. Everybody had the same question. So I took the reference book and I dropped it like that. And it hit and it opened up to the right answer. Because everybody had been going to that book to get the, the, the answer. So I said, oh, that's cool. Yeah, what, what other books can I do this with? You know, I've got my answer right there. So anyway, we also need to talk about Jerusalem. You heard about Jerusalem? You know where that is? Well, that's a town in the United States somewhere, right? You know, some people think that, but it, it is. But Jerusalem, over in Israel. 
Ezekiel said, this is what the Lord God says. I have set this Jerusalem in the center of the nations with countries all around her. We need to pray for Israel. We need to be basically have faithful service and ministry where we're at, but also for Israel. Because guess who, is, guess who Israel belongs to? Who does Israel belong to? God. The Hebrews are God's chosen people. Jerusalem is known as the city of David, but also the city of God. So he's going to protect it. He, we're not going to see Jerusalem disappear. We're not going to see Israel disappear. God's protecting it. No matter what happens. So, now, a lot of times we read these verses during this time of year. Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. If, you're, if your God is Lord in your nation, that nation is blessed. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts or lifts up a nation, but sin is a reproach, disgrace to any people. You get that? Righteousness builds you up. Sin tears you down. And then, as we see this in, uh, in Isaiah 5, verse 20, and you've probably heard this quoted before. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness? Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? We have people now that are calling good bad and bad good. And it's wrong. It's all messed up. It's not the way. And Isaiah is saying, you know, people were doing this back then. Even Israel were calling good bad and bad good. No, that's not it. So, in Acts chapter 5, the disciples of Jesus Christ. This is after Jesus ascended into heaven. This is after Holy Spirit came and anointed the disciples. And this is when they began to teach and to preach and tell people about Jesus Christ. And they were in Jerusalem. And it was after the Passover. A bunch of people still there. And they were talking. And there were people who didn't like it. They were doing signs and wonders. Basically, this was legitimizing the words that they were preaching. That's what Jesus, when he performed the miracles, it was just adding credence to the words he was saying. Yes, this is true. It's not just something we're making up. But look at this. So there are signs and wonders. And the disciples, where did they go in and out of? Right when they started. Any of y'all been to jail? Any of y'all been locked up? These guys were locked up in jail. Because, simply because, they were telling people about Jesus Christ. They were in and out of prison. And then they, uh, and then the, this, this time that in Acts chapter 5, these guys were locked up in jail. <clears throat> and then the Sanhedrin, they said, okay, you know, they left them in there overnight. They said, okay, bring them out. Bring them out. You know, we, we, you know, put them on trial again. So the jail keeper, he goes in. I mean, everything's secure. He walks in, he opens the door, and guess who isn't there? They're not there. Man, they're scratching their head going, what in the world? And Scripture tells us that an angel came, let him out, and said, keep going. Keep preaching. And, but everything was secure when they came in. And then a guy comes and they go, where did they go? I don't know. People were in trouble. And then a guy comes running in and he says, hey. He said, man, those guys you locked up, they're over in the temple complex. And they're teaching. They're, they're, that's where they're at. So the Sanhedrin, they sent a contingency of temple soldiers there, and they <clears throat> they didn't arrest them. They politely escorted them back to the court. Because they were afraid. Scripture says that they were afraid that if the people saw that they were being physically arrested and manhandled, that the people were going to stone them. People were going to kill the temple guard. Because they wanted to hear what these people were saying. So, they're brought back in front of these guys. And the guys are, you know, they're all dressed up. They're right there in front of them. And they say, didn't we strictly order you not to teach in his, this name, the name of Jesus? Look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Guess who had him crucified? I mean, it's just the truth. But Peter and the apostles, they replied simply this. We must obey God rather than men. 
He wasn't being stuck up. He wasn't being presumptuous. He wasn't being prideful. He was just saying, this is our driving force. We are to obey God rather than men. So he says, the God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to us that we who obey him. All people, Peter was saying this. All we're doing is sharing what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have been taught, and what we have been we have experienced. That's all we're doing. We're just telling you what it is, how it is, and what we know. So the thing is. When it comes to a point, it's not a great picture that's been painted, but when it comes to a point, we need to have the answer like Peter. We are to serve uh, God rather than man. We need to obey God. So what can we do? Well, we have to remember this, that there's victory in the gospel. The message of the gospel, what does it do? It transforms people. It changes people. And the work of the gospel, no matter what's going on, it's still expanding. It's still going on in different places. And the followers of the gospel are maturing. And so what, what do we need to do? We need to talk about the gospel. We need to think about it, make it a picture in our life. We need to ponder the gospel in our minds. And we need to practice our faith. Romans 1, verse 16. Paul was writing the letter to the church at Rome. The Christians who were there. And he said in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And this is why. Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and also to the Greek. And you get that phrase, it is the power of God. That word power, we get our word dynamite from that word. Dunamis, dynamite. We had a neat little discussion Wednesday night about dynamite in prayer meetings. See what y'all miss out don't come to prayer meeting. We talk about dynamite. And so, but you know, how many of you shot off some dynamite for 4th of July? Anybody do that? No? Okay. Uh, we came close when we were kids. We had M80s and cherry bombs, but no dynamite. But Paul is saying the gospel has power. The gospel has power to change. And then we need to live as end times people. I think we're in those times. And so we need to live that way. You've received grace through salvation through Jesus Christ. So you need to be a light and to reflect that light. And you need to re reveal the darkness that you see and be the light in that darkness. Talk to people. Let them know where you stand, who you are, and to let them know where you are. And the thing is to finish strong. Any of y'all ever run a race? Well, years ago, I used to run. I remember eighth grade PE class. You know, we got out there and uh, you know just had a whole class. We were doing track and field. That was the we were at six weeks at that time, not eight weeks. Track and field with our six weeks subject. And so coach got us out there and uh, we had a basically it was a we had kind of a track around our football field or our baseball field and you know it wasn't a, a formal track but you could tell where people had to run so. We got going, and you know, you know, you always have these people that run. You know, yeah. All right, go. You know, they, they think it's a sprint, but we had to run this thing. I mean, like twice. And so these guys, you know, out front, they're just, you know, they're going, going, going. And I'm just going, ah, I'll never catch them. So I just kept the pace up, and you know, the first. First lap, you know, some of these guys were still going, but then, you know, about the second lap, about a quarter of the way through, some of them guys forgot about being sprinters, and they were thinking more about surviving. I mean, they were sucking air bad. And, and I just kept my, my pace, because I was in the back of the line. And the, the, I think I finished like, you know, fifth or sixth, you know, after all was said and done. The thing is, we need to finish strong. We might not start out the best, but you need to finish strong. Finish strong. Paul wrote to Archippus. He was at the church in Colossia. He said, tell Archippus, pay attention to the ministry you have received in the Lord so that you can accomplish it. Pay attention to the ministry you have received.
received in the Lord so that you can accomplish it. You can finish it. So we need to finish strong. We need to finish strong in our faith. Let's bow our heads, please. As we see our country, see things that are going on, we need to continue strong and to finish strong. That's the way we need to do. I didn't say we're going to be perfect the whole way. We're probably going to have some bumps and you know, a little bit of detours and oh man, I should have done that different. The thing is, we need to finish strong. We need to finish and be faithful. You know, what did Paul say? I have run the course, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. That's, that's what should be said of each of us. Finish strong. Run strong and finish strong and consistent. We have a, a, Karen's going to play a verse. Are you running with Jesus? Are you running from Him? Or are you running to Him or running with Him? You know, putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You know, we do that. We get salvation, eternal life. But the thing is, we should be going with Him each day. should be a growing relationship each single day. Do you have that growing relationship? Let me stand by these flowers, this table. If you'd like to come and pray, come and talk to me. Talk to me at the church, whatever you'd like to do. Deal with God in your seat. Deal with Him down here. Whatever you need to do, do it. Deal with it. Don't assume, but deal with it.
and uh, just, just work out those logistics. So if y'all please stand, y'all ready to go home? No, I meant ready to make the dash to your car so you can turn on the AC so you can go home. How many of y'all are brave enough you're just going to roll the windows down? Go home. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. All right, so Sam, sir, please would you dismiss us in prayer? Hey, go ahead. Let us take this walk in our day and her today and about a day of the lives as we made before and bring us back next week. And here's the Lord, by name. Amen. Amen.